It's not the things inside my head that keep me going Don't need someone to throw me money, they should show it Keep chasing shadows, they're always haunting me But I believe in something bigger Uh, what's up Active Fam? Welcome back to another episode of the ABWT FM series. Like we explained in the last episode, myself and Nathan are going to be giving you guys a little bit more of an insight about what Nathan's been doing with his diet, what he's going to be doing with his supplements, and how he's going to manipulate calories and the macros as he leads into his show. We're going to actually do a little bit of meal prepping as well, so I'm actually at Nathan's apartment right now. Where's the fucking oil at? Alright, so it's all happening. It's 2019, are we 2019? Yeah. Yeah, 2019. <laughs> and we're currently 12 weeks and six days out of my first pro show, being the Chicago Pro. My second pro show is gonna be a week later in Vancouver. So I'm flying from Melbourne to Chicago. I'm gonna be there for a week to do my first show there. I'm gonna fly to Vancouver it's just after that, do a week there, and then I'm gonna come home. Now these shows, this is the macro bodybuilding. Out of thousands and thousands of competitors in the world, there are 20 people in the world that qualify every year for Olympia. And to be able to do that, you have to win a pro show. All right, so we are back and this is going to be better than ever. And the first thing I wanted to talk to you guys about is mental state. Now I have done a lot of bodybuilding shows and I have competed every single year since I ever first started bodybuilding back in 2013. In that time, I've traveled overseas in snatches and amateur. I've competed in a lot of different shows. I've done qualifying shows. And I've done the most prestigious bodybuilding show in Australia every single year from then. Let me tell you the biggest, the most important part about any dream in life, anything, you guys can be relative to this, whether you're a bodybuilder or not, is mental state. Now, mental state is by far the number one thing. Doesn't matter how much drugs you have, doesn't matter how many steroids you take, doesn't matter how good you eat, doesn't matter how good your meat is, doesn't matter how hard you train. If your mental state is not 100% on, you're not gonna look good. So many different things in our body can occur when we're upset or when we're sad. And that is directly related to cortisol, directly related to muscle atrophy, and directly related to losing muscle, gaining fat, not what we want to achieve as bodybuilders. So before you guys go into a prep, make sure that everything in your life is working. Now I use this analogy a lot, a spin the plate analogy. I'm gonna really touch base on that really quickly. And that is that what do you need in your life to be happy and to be successful? Okay, I need my family. I need my career, which is my bodybuilding. That's my personal thing. I need business because I love living a good life. And I need a few other things as well. Every one of those things in my life represent a different plate. Now, I have two hands, one holding the camera, one hand here. For me to be able to get one of those plates, put something here and spin a plate, what I need to do, you know those clowns, how they spin plates at the show? What I need to do is I need to spin each plate individually. Now, each plate represents a different part of life. One plate represents bodybuilding, my daughter, business, whatever it may be. And for me to be happy, all plates need to be spinning. But the thing is, the catch is, I can only spin one plate at a time. Look at your plates and go, first realize what do you need to be happy and make sure those plates are always spinning. For the next 13 weeks, I'm gonna put all of my emphasis on my bodybuilding plate. Man, my shoulder's getting sore. I'm gonna spin that plate so hard that in 13 weeks time, when this is all done and dusted, I can let that plate go for a while because for the next nine months, that plate's gonna spin by itself. Then I'm gonna work on, look at my other plates going on right here. And I'm gonna go, which plate can I see is about to topple over? And whatever plate that may be is the plate I'm gonna spin. The moral of the story is this, to be happy and to be successful, it's all about your mental state. And over the next 13 weeks, I'm gonna do really well, I'm gonna kill it because right now I've never ever been stronger. All right guys, so basically what we're gonna to do today is go over a little bit more of Nathan's uh, nutrition side of things. We're gonna talk a little bit about his food, we're gonna talk about how he's changed up his diet in terms of cleaning it up, or what he does in the first I don't know, four to six weeks versus what he's gonna do in the last six to eight weeks. So today we've got a little bit of, um, what is that, I feel it? Yeah. I feel it. All right, so now first thing for me, about 22 weeks out from a bodybuilding show, I say to myself, okay, Nathan, 
you're gonna be doing a bodybuilding show. And because I know what it takes psychologically, physically, emotionally to do a bodybuilding show, I'm preparing myself. So from 22 weeks out, I'm just doing things like thinking about the show, doing things like changing my mindset slightly, doing things like cleaning my diet up just a little bit. Now being a professional in a bodybuilder 21st century, you don't need to eat chicken and broccoli all throughout a day to look good and to feel good. You just don't. Understand that there is a time and a place for everything. Now, I have an off season and in my off season, I relax a little bit. I have a few drinks, I party a little bit, I go out with my friends, I have dinner, whatever I wanna do. I just make sure I stay within a certain category, within a certain look. I'm not gonna let myself get extremely fat and just stop training, but I don't need to live and breathe bodybuilding 24 hours a day. So from 22 weeks out, I start changing my thought process from that off season, enjoying life a little bit, to just making a few changes. So let's say for example this, in my off season, every night before bed, my favorite thing to eat is cookies and cream connoisseur ice cream with a heap of Nutella. Oh yeah, yeah. Now, <laughs> I, I can't eat that in prep. So what I do from 22 weeks out, is I take, you're gonna do the oh yeah, yeah thing. Yeah, bro, yeah, you yeah, know I know, it. I know you are. It's gonna say at the bottom Subtitles, of the screen. Yeah. Um, I take the cookies and cream condensed ice cream out and I put in Halo Top. So Halo Top still tastes good, but only has 300 calories. So I'm going from like 2000 calories to 300 and I still get to enjoy my ice cream on my balcony, which I sit on every single night. So that's one of the things I do. I do that with a lot of things in my life. If I'm at the gym, I usually have a protein bar. I just tell myself, no, no, no protein bar. So I make small incremental changes throughout from 22 weeks out to about 18 weeks out so that when I come time to dieting my mind is set my mind is going I'm ready to approach the prep but I don't go so hard that I burn out easy that's the biggest thing you don't want to burn out now we're 13 weeks out so over the last couple of weeks what I've done I understand that every prep is going to be a little bit differently and you guys can't compare your preps and what you want to do based on what I do because cut a long story short base metabolic rate is determined by the amount of muscle mass you have if you have more muscle you can consume more calories at rest or consume more calories at a day and you can burn more calories at rest because the amount of calories you burn a day is determined how much muscle you have. So you guys can't be looking at what I'm doing and be relative to what you're doing because what I do and what you do are gonna be two different things. But for me, 30 weeks out right now, my diet consists of a little bit like this. Now what I do from week 16 to about week, let's say week nine, it's crazy. I cut my calories from about 7,500 calories a day to about 2,500, 3,000. That is a dramatic drop. And I do not stay at that amount of calories throughout my entire prep. I just make that initial cut from about, from about 16 weeks out, what like I said, to about eight, just so I can get the majority of the body fat off. So right now, my body is a bit flat, it's a bit soft, it's a bit, it doesn't look the best right now. Because you sort of sometimes in prep, you gotta go backwards a little bit before you go forwards. Now this is the biggest thing for people who lose, trying to lose weight, and every single person watching this film right now can relate to this. And that is when you guys first start dieting, are your shoulders hurting? No, no, it's all right. When you guys first start dieting, the first thing you do is you go, okay, you're motivated and you're determined and you're like, I wanna look good, I wanna get lean. So what you do is you start dieting, you start taking your carbohydrates out, you start doing a little bit of cardio, and then the initial phase, you start seeing the weight drop off. Now, it's, this is very, very demotivating at times once you get to a certain stage. I'm gonna tell you why. Because what happens is when you're in off season, you're satisfied with eating, or let's say you're a regular person just trying to lose weight, and you just you flick that switch and gone, I wanna look good. When you're in that mindset where you're eating more food, off season or as a regular person, you were enjoying what you're eating, you weren't craving, you were satisfied all the time. You looked yourself in the mirror one day and you said, I wanna make change. So you started making change. And the first couple of weeks you start seeing the scales drop, you're motivated. Then you get to that stage, the plateau, where the weight doesn't go anywhere. You start putting in extra work, nothing happens. Now, before you can start looking good, you have to start looking worse first. And yo-yo dieting and yo-yo training 21st century is so common. What happens is, imagine right, I'm eating a lot of food. My muscles are full to the brim with carbs and chocolate and all this sort of stuff. I may not be lean, but I look full and big. I feel good, but I'm sick of the fat around my stomach. So what I do is I start dieting, I start pulling all that stuff out. Now, glycogen, right, is a carbohydrate. Carbohydrates on the outside of your body, on the in the CID body is called glycogen. Now glycogen or glucose, glycogen cells are in your liver and your muscles. So when we consume carbohydrates, they go down our esophagus into our stomach, they metabolize through our intestinal walls into our bloodstream, our body creates an insulin response and our pancreas, the insulin drives those carbs into your muscle. Now what happens is then you have nice big full-round muscle bellies. So you take those carbohydrates away and what's gonna happen is your muscles are gonna deflate. 
you're not losing muscle, even though in the gym you're not as strong, your primary source of energy is decreasing. So you start thinking, shit, I'm losing muscle because your muscles look smaller, you can't see lines anymore, and you're weaker. In actual fact, that's not what actually happens. What happens is your glycogen is depleting because you've cut carbohydrates one, and you still have that layer of body fat over the top you always had. So when you guys get to that stage, women, guys, whoever, you start feeling a little bit skinny, fat, don't stop there and go, oh, I hate this, I'm gonna start bulking because I'm not big enough. That's not the case. Everyone's got to go for that middle stage. So that's what I'm going through now. The middle stage where I feel flat, I feel soft, I'm weak, and it's a really demotivating feeling. But once I get to the eight week mark stage or the nine week mark stage, where I start seeing those lines come through, that's when I start putting the calories back in and start looking good. So from now until week nine, my calories are low. My diet looks a little bit like this. This is organic I feel at stake. Now I only eat organic. I don't really know if it makes much of a difference. I just do it because it makes me mentally feel better. So you don't have to eat organic steak, but I eat fats, a high dose of protein, and a higher dose of fat, and a low dose of carbohydrates from in this period like I'm telling you about. Secondly, I do this. I make sure that uh, I'm only having carbohydrates around my workout. Understand that when you consume carbohydrates in your workout, we go and we train, we use those carbohydrates to lift as heavy as we can, the best, most articulate way possible to get that nice muscle. And then post-workout, put a little bit more carbohydrates in just to replenish our cells so we don't start using muscle as energy. So for the next six weeks, that's what I'm gonna be doing. And the diet will change from changing there on in. All right, now, as an IFB professional body of myself, obviously, there are hormones involved. And I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions about the hormones and all that sort of stuff inclusive, but steroids, growth hormone, insulin, all these drugs that people take is not the basis of being a good successful bodybuilder. For me, like I touched base on before, a good, amazing, successful bodybuilder is all about mental state. So I have little things in my life that I need in order to be happy. Like this splitting the plate thing that I talked to you guys about before a clean environment like I saw it before. You can't just take steroids and expect the steroids to do the work for you. They will only do a small portion of what you already have going on for you in your life. The first thing is mental state. The second thing is understanding what you need to be successful in your chosen sport, which right now is bodybuilding. And the third thing is everything tying together, the kingpin in the middle. So basically, yes, they do help. And in the later vlogs, I'm gonna go into hormones and how they work, but we can't just take steroids. Steroids will have an adverse reaction in your body and they do do things that we don't want to happen to us. So hence before, like I said, you know, doing things like glutathione injections, getting regular checkups. Steroids is not the base of being a successful bodybuilder, mental state, living a clean, organized environment that makes you feel good about yourself and everything in between is what's gonna make you successful. So last year, for example, I uh, done my first pro show at the Arnold Classic Australia. Adam went through a really, really hard time. Uh, I had some personal stuff going on and my head just was not in it. In the end, I used the show as an escape for what I was going through in my private life to in hope let that pain go away and it was the worst thing I ever done. As an amateur the year before, when I went pro down on Classic Australia, I weighed in on stage at 108 kilos, dry, shredded to the bone. The year later, as a pro, I went from 108 to 102. Not only did I lose six kilos of muscle tissue in that 12 months, I wasn't as conditioned on stage either. So in reality, I probably should have been 100. Touching base again on hormones, hormones is not the key to success. A lot of people take it, a lot of people don't. Yes, being a pro bodybuilder, I do. But hormones is not the basis of my prep. And going through all the different shows just made me realize that I am not gonna go into a show or do something like this until my headspace is good. That's why this year I know you will see the best Nathan James Williams from you guys have ever seen because I've never been happier psychologically. My life is in order. I've got heaps of Windex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I my feel house good. is fucking clean. <laughs> Fuck, look at the mess that Nathan just made. We're gonna have to get the Windex out soon. Anxiety that right is now. fucked up, bro. This gonna be the most anxiety right Oh now. no. <laughs> so, talk about cheat meals as well, uh, being 13 weeks out. Now, I do something different every single year, but with cheat meals, everything what I'm doing right now is instead of having like a big crazy cheat meal, 
what I'm doing right now is I'm having like three small ones a week. Now that chamber doesn't consist of anything crazy. I'll go out with the boys uh, a couple of nights ago and we had a 500 grand ribeye on the bone with some bit of vegetables. Wasn't really a cheat meal, had a little bit of sauce, but it wasn't something I can have on a daily basis. The reason I'm asking is because I don't do cheat meals when I'm dieting. Like I'll do like six weeks of just straight dieting, no cheat meals. And after six weeks into say a 12 week prep, I'll reward myself and I'll have a full blown cheat meal where I'll have KFC, fucking donuts and whatever it is but you know what the next day i actually feel like i fill out and i'm still looking just as full and lean so to me that's like i know my body and i can't afford to do cheat meals every week so i just do refeeds so a refeed to me is like salmon with a fuckload of potatoes that i don't even measure and a nice big salad with avocados and that to me is still clean food that my body's going to be able to absorb and use um, but it's a reset. So my mindset come Monday, it's like it's ready to go to eat the chicken and all that bland bullshit, but I still try and make my food taste good. And I feel like with dieting, consistency comes from making your food taste good. If you're eating plain chicken, rice and broccoli every single day, there's no way you're gonna end up sticking to the diet, which is why people crash towards the end of a diet as their body fat's dropping down and they can't think straight and all they're thinking about is the shit meal that's coming up. But in a diet, I'm actually thinking about my meals, thinking like, fuck, I can't wait to eat that chicken and rice because I got that sweet chili light sauce on there. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah. with Nathan though, from what I've heard from his preps, he actually can afford to have a cheat meal literally like once a week. And generally it is like a burger or something like that. But again, he's 30 kilos heavier than me. So his body can consume a burger a lot easier than I could during a prep when I'm weighing like 75 kilos. Okay, so for me, I suppose with my body, uh, with, my, with my approach to this sport, the most important thing to me is I need to be able to have some sort of escape, some sort of avenue. You, you get up every single day, I'm at the gym at 7 a.m., I leave the gym at 7 p.m., I feel claustrophobic and I feel trapped in the sport. Now, it's okay to feel that way, but if I can somehow get some sort of relief outside of that, um, then I feel better. So this year, what I'm doing currently right now, instead of having a big cheat meal each week like I usually would in previous years, uh, previous years I would go six days full blown, six and a half days full blown dieting. On a Sunday at around about five o'clock in the afternoon, I would start eating like a main meal, um, usually Kuniti's, pizza, pasta, whatever. And then for the rest of the night until I go to sleep, like a six hour window, I can consume whatever I want to consume. Probably not the best approach, but it, but it was all right. It worked and I got on stage um, in really good shape. All right, cool. So basically just touch base on what Nathan just said. I feel like refeeds and cheat meals are also another good way to just touch base with your friends because as you would know if you've ever competed, bodybuilding consumes your life. It's basically you, your meals, and the weights. And that's basically like a Monday to Friday sort of thing, maybe Monday to Saturday. So come Sunday at the end of the week, I reckon it's a very good idea to touch base with some of your friends and just get outside of that mentality that it's you against the world because at the end of the day, the better support network that you have over your prep and the better mental state that you can get yourself into, the more efficient and the basically the more fluent it's gonna become. So catching up with friends on a Sunday and having salmon around at my house was literally what I did every single Sunday. We actually called it Salmon Sundays, if you remember my vlogs from when I did the Olympia. So my recommendation to you guys, it doesn't have to be on a Sunday, but just whenever you can, try and fit in a cheat meal or, a, or just even a refeed and move outside of the bodybuilding world for one day. All right, guys, it is Friday down at ABW, and it is my favorite day of the week because I get to train with big Nathan James Williamson, IFBB pro, and today we are crushing chest. <laughs> Fuck, I sound like Nathan Harder. <laughs> All right, so Nathan's got a little bit of a headache, he was just telling me. So we're starting with a little bit of cable flies. Now, generally, we would probably do presses first, but We've actually decided we're gonna hit the cables to push a bit of blood into the chest, get a little bit of a pump going, and then maybe hit some, um, what do you wanna do, barbell or dumbbell today? Probably both, probably both. Fuck, oh, this headache is killing me. Yeah, I've been here like Tuesday morning, Thursday. What's that called? I got the zoom now. Digital zoom, watch this. Where is he? 
leaning forward as his arms go back to create a deeper stretch through his chest, leaning backwards as his hands go forward to enable him to contract the upper part of his chest without the interior portion of his delt working. We're doing a drop set starting at 15 kilos, dropping down to 10 and then dropping down to five. Again, understanding that muscles grow by stretching and contracting, ensuring you get a full range of motion stretch on the way down and a full range of motion contraction on the way up, holding the contraction at the top and leaving the weight back down through your chest on the way down. Four strips here. Last drop. Understand, like I previously just said, muscles grow by stretching and contracting. So if you maximize the stretch and maximize the contraction, through placement of your body and exertion of how you move the weight, that's how you're gonna grow. Uh, hop, oh, hop, oh. <laughs> it looks like he's doing yoga. Uh, so, on that last drop set, then, when I was doing the 7.5 kilos, when I'm using a lighter weight, I'll generally push the weight further away from my body. So, I actually opened up my palms and I was squeezing like that. That applies a longer lever. So when I'm going like this and pushing away, it's gonna put more pressure through my chest where if I'm going heavier and I'm bending my elbows a little bit more, when I squeeze together, <laughs> when, I, when I squeeze together, obviously my, if my elbow's bent, there's gonna be a little bit more recrucian of my anterior delt. So to take the delt out of it as you drop the weight down, straighten out your arms a little bit, push out in front of your body, turn your palms slightly upwards. Lever forward, squeeze out like that. Recruitment. Articulation! All right, so we're gonna do straight bar today. The reason why we're doing straight bar opposed to dumbbells is because I just got treatment done uh, down at Dynamic Health and Recovery through Brooke and she really nailed my rotator cuff. So my infrared is the rotator cuff at the back of my shoulder and that works by stabilizing this movement. So if I'm holding dumbbells, the, the infrared spinatus is going to stop me from doing this way, going up and down, up and down, stabilizing the weight, which is why I'm going to do a straight bar because those muscles are quite sore now from treatment. So. So second exercise then we're doing flat bench. Now as I am in prep for the Chicago Pro in 12 weeks, I'm lifting a little heavy in my prep now. Uh, whenever I start preps with bodybuilding shows, my primary focus is to put my body into lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat into energy. So to get my body into that, I first need to deplete my body of glycogen. So the first thing I'm doing is I'm training hard and heavy. Glycogen is depl depleted primarily the fastest with heavy movements. Did you have any carbs before your workout? Yeah, I did, but I use I do plenty to lift weight. Okay. So the reason why because I think that's important because the reason why I have carbohydrates pre-workout, even though I'm trying to deplete carbohydrates, understanding carbohydrates primarily are utilized as energy. When we're in the gym and we're training, not only do I need to get in condition for show, but I need to maximize on my muscle growth. So if I don't have energy to move weight, I'm physically cannot possibly grow. So what I'm doing, having carbohydrates pre-workout, training as hard as I possibly can, lifting as heavy as I can to utilize those carbohydrates to make my muscles work, to in turn grow muscle, and then put my body into lipolysis with the heavy lifting so that post-workout I can start utilizing fat as energy. A really big thing that a lot of competitors, first time competitors go wrong is that they think that, oh, I need to deplete my body of all carbohydrates and I need to train on an empty stomach or with just protein and fats in my diet which essentially is just gonna make your training sessions get shitter and shitter and shitter as you get deeper and deeper into a prep. And I've seen it, like people go from looking really good in their off season to just looking like absolute shit and just flat and they, their muscle just looks like it's just like disintegrating into nothing. And that's basically because they don't have carbs in the system and over like four or six weeks of doing that, your muscles are gonna end up looking like shit by the time you get on stage. So make sure you fuel up for your sessions. If you're gonna structure your carbs anywhere in, your, in the day, make sure it's around training, then you can lay off the carbs in, later in the day. <laughs> oh shit.
Now you guys would have seen that last step about rep five. The weight to me didn't really feel all that heavy, but I was really struggling to stabilize in the movement. And that all comes down to activation of stabilizer. Now, as I just got treatment done this morning about an hour and a half before we started training, my stabilizers, because they were worked, are a little bit sore, a little bit of inflammation through there. So they're finding it hard to grab when I go to press. So a lot of the time, if you guys can't lift heavy or move weight correctly, it isn't because the weight is too heavy, it's because your stabilizers aren't engaging. So exercise number three, using a sifter machine so we don't have to worry about stabilization too much as my last set, my stabilizer muscles didn't really work that well. So using the sifter machine and the bands, I don't have to worry about my stabilizers as much as I usually have to. Now, I'm doing decline today purely because in a front double bicep on stage, the lower part of my chest is not that great when I put my elbows back. By increasing muscle mass through the decline part of my chest, when I bring my arms back to create a front double bicep pose, the thickness of my chest will still remain there. The only bodybuilder that I can really see that has that is Phil Heath. And that's what we're trying to mimic right now with this movement. Heady wearing the uh, Royal Blue ABW singlet. This is the high performance one. Nice material, lightweight, breathable. There's the angle right there. Oh, I'm dieting for the Chicago Pro. Yeah, no, I'm not going one more. <laughs> Eddie's just doing whatever. Still leaner. <laughs> This exercise working the bottom part of my chest where it originates in the middle, the decline part of the origin of the chest. Again, for the same reason when I pose, coming forward, always touch right in by your side and the weight sort of being pushed through my pinkies. Leaning forward, go stretch. And from a full stretch, in my mind, I'm contracting for the middle first. So I'm pulling through here as soon as I start moving. Lean back so that the Weight is in my chest, not my shoulders. Explosive movement on the bottom. Oh, you're so full. Fuck. Is that right? All right, now from here, I'm going to your side. Talk about that so they can hear. Elbows in by your side. <laughs> yeah. All right, now from here, just go. So come forward to there. Straight arms. Yep. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Now, keep your arms straight. Put sort of just, now bring your arms, elbows back. Just tuck them right into your side. Come just to here. Now go. A little bit lean back. Lean back, yeah. Oh, yeah. Keep it low, keep it low. Keep it to here. Don't bring your shoulders in. Just from the initiation of the start of the movement, engage here. And scoop it up. Uh, Grab it from the bottom here first, scoop it under here. Ooh. There we go. Oh yeah, no, stop second. Grab it here, do that. There we go. Uh, I have to pause and scoop. And initiate. Good. Uh, scoop. And your whole idea is you put any by side there and you put your pinkies that way. So you're doing that. Yep. There we go. Uh, Beautiful, you go up here, he's that way. There we go. Oh, squeeze up, three, two, one. How did that feel? Oh, that was the best one, yeah. yeah. Less weight and just stricter. So I'm gonna do it.